Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Greetings everyone and good evening. I hope you're doing well. I'm Anas Dijani and I'm going to be your host for today. On behalf of the Saudi Prosthodontic Society, I would like to welcome you all in our first ever abroad webinar with live demonstration all the way from the United States. Before introducing our speakers for the day, we would like to thank you all for your continuous interest in attending our online lectures. We hope you're enjoying our webinar sessions and getting the best out, out, out of our previous excellent speakers. Just a reminder for our dear participants, if you are seeking to receive certificates for attending our webinars, please be advised that you need to be a Saudi Prosthodontic Society member. You can find the registration link in our Twitter account at Saudi Prosto. As for now, I'm glad to introduce to you our, our speakers for the day, who happens to be with us live from Boston, Dr. Taha Masoud and his colleague, Dr. Sean Lee. Dr. Taha Masoud, he is the president of the International Scientific Education, the ISE. He is currently the post, he is, he is currently, he is currently and postdoctoral resident of prosthodontic in Boston University and the chairman of postgraduate residence in the New England USA of the American Dental Education Association, the ADEA. He started his career as a resident in the dental and the maxillofacial department at the Saudi German hospital, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Before starting his residency in the US, he, has, he, he was continuing dental education director at the German Saudi, uh, at the Saudi German hospital uh, he has given lectures and workshops locally as well as internationally in German, Denmark, Holland, U UAE, and Saudi Arabia, and finally the United States. Uh, with the other speaker, uh, Dr. Sean Lee, he started his dental journey at the Taipei Medical University, where he earned his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree. He then received training in multiple aspects of dentistry in Changgong Memorial Hospital, the largest hospital system in the all of the Eastern Asia. After completing general practice residency, he decided to pursue periodontology and implantology residency at the prestigious Boston University Goldman School of Dental Medicine, where he also did extensive research in the field of periodontal inflammation and inhibition. Dr. Lee is passionate about periodontal surgery, microsurgery, implantology, and photography. Dr. Taha and Dr. Shan Lee, you can start unmuting yourself now and the mic is yours. So hello everyone from all parts of the world. Thank you so much Dr. Anas for this great introduction. Uh, also I would like to thank uh, Saudi Presidentic Society, the chairman of the Presidentic Society, Dr. Mansour Asiri, Dr. Adnan Ishgi. Thank you so much all of you for this uh, great chance. So <clears throat> it's an honor for us to be here with you, even if it's through the screens. So the topic is DENTOF, which is practical dental photography, which we started here in Boston University for the pre-docs. So the idea is to give clinical stuff from A to Z and to make everyone understand the clinical part. So we, don't, we are not going to bore you with the settings and everything that much. We have to explain a little bit, but mostly it will be all clinical stuff. So as Dr. Ness mentioned, my name is Taha Masoud. I'm a uh, prosthodontic resident in Boston University and my colleague. Hello, I'm Dr. Sean Lee. I'm a periodontology resident at Boston University. So this is where we are right now. This is the dental building of the Goldman School of Dental Medicine. So the postgraduate department, it's on second floor and seventh floor. So we are on the second floor. And if any one of you have any questions also regarding the postgraduate studies in USA, we are here where like your brothers will support you in whatever you want. So before we dive into the photography stuff, we just wanted to discuss a little bit about the COVID-19. And I know I'm not going to scare anyone. It's just something good I would like to share with all of you because just two days ago, CDC they announced these guidelines that the coming two weeks are going to be very important. So we have to take extra protective measures in this time, because if we did, then it's going to be better for all of us and the less number of cases will be affected. But if we did not take these protective measures, then the number of cases will be high. So the coming two weeks, guys, it's very important. 
Okay, so let's cut straight to our topic. So why do we need dental photography? I believe everyone uh, probably has an answer already. And I think that we can sum it up in a single sentence, which is a picture is worth a thousand words. However, to get that picture, we need a lot of practice and we need a basic understanding outline today. We're going to be covering everything on here. Okay, so you've probably seen the meme, you, versus uh, the guy she tells you not to worry about. So what is the difference between these two photos? So the first one on the top is taken with a pointed shoot. The second one is taken with a DSLR plus diffusion. So DSLR stands for a digital single lens reflex camera. Uh, it's just the most common type of camera we use. And diffusion is just a technique that we will talk about later. Okay, so uh, you can see that the first photo over here is actually a very good photo. It's very clear. However, I believe that uh, dental photography has evolved from pure documentation to having artistic value. And uh, we need our photos to be presentable to even our patients because it is the age of social media. Okay, let's take a look at another example. So this one uh, on the top is taken with the phone camera. And this one is taken again with the DSLR plus diffusion. So I actually have uh, some friends that are still taking clinical photos with the phone camera. Please do not do that anymore. It is the year 2020. So you can see there's a huge difference between the quality of these two. Okay, so when you have a uh, DSLR and you combine it with the macro lens, you'll have a very powerful combination. We'll talk about the macro lens later. But you can see a lot of details that are actually uh, invisible to the naked eyes otherwise. Okay, so which brings us to our next topic, which is uh, the selection of camera and lens. So when it comes to this, the first question we get asked is, uh, which one is better, the Canon or the Nikon? Well, rumor has it that uh, Albert Einstein believes that Canon is better for gums and Nikon is better for teeth. However, Charles Darwin believes that Canon is better for videos while Nikon is better for photos. So in case you're wondering the reason behind Charles Darwin thinking that Nikon is better for photos, well, we got to the bottom of it. So he's actually sponsored by Nikon. He's getting paid from them. <laughs> True story. So again, just to sum it up, the difference between Canon and Nikon is the difference between Ronaldo and Messi. Both of them are the best. It depends on which one that you like more, okay? But if you like Ronaldo, then I'm with you also, okay? Okay, so after you've decided uh, Nikon, Canon, or any other brand you like, you will have to choose between a full frame sensor and a crop sensor. So what's the difference between the two? So you can see the full frame sensor is around 35 millimeters, while the crop sensor is uh, 24 millimeters. This is the APS-C, the most common one. So as you can see, the, uh, full the full frame sensor actually has a area 2.5 times larger than the crop sensor. So what difference does that make? So it makes the full frame sensor having better quality due to having bigger and better pixels. And moreover, it has better features because it is a higher end model and the company just gives them more features. So now again, to sum it up in a nice way, you can see that there is a full frame sensor and a crop sensor, okay? So now Dr. Lee is going to explain to you one small thing, which is the crop factor. Yeah, so when it comes to taking clinical photos, there is a huge difference between the two. It is called the crop factor, which is about 1.5. So what do we mean by that? So actually, when you take a photo at the same distance, the cropped frame camera will only capture about two thirds the amount of uh, the amount compared to the full frame. So if you want to fit the same amount of stuff in your cropped photo, you will have to stand back and distance yourself from the object. So if you see that if you are starting to learn dental photography, and if you want to do it for social media and for fun, then you can go ahead with the cropped frame camera, okay? But if you would like to take presentation and you would like to present in a higher resolution, then you should go ahead with the full frame camera. Plus the price difference, it's huge. If you look at it, that the Canon is $1,400, the full frame one, the basic model. 
And here you can take the $400 one uh, crop frame and even it comes with a lens, which is not useful for dentistry, but it's still, we're just telling you that the difference of price, it's huge. Okay, so after you've decided your camera body, the next thing you need to get is a macro lens. So what is a macro lens? It is a lens capable of reproducing an image ratio of one to one. And when you want this image ratio, you will have a minimum focusing distance depending on the focal length of your of your lens. So for example, this is a 100 millimeter macro lens. So the minimum focusing distance is 0.31 meters away from your object. So according to the definition, there are actually focal lengths that uh, have 40 to 60 that can also produce an image ratio of one to one. So for example, the 60 millimeter on your, uh, the right of your screen, so this one can also do that. However, you can see the minimum focusing distance here is 0.2 meters, which brings you really close to the patient. And combine that with the fact that this focal length will actually cause facial distortion when taking portrait photos. So this is not a good lens for dental photography. So in fact, the best macro lens for dental photography is something between 85 and 105 millimeters. Okay, so what lenses do we have to choose from? So for the Canon one, you can get a 100 millimeter macro lens. For the Nikon, you can get an 85 or a 105. So these are the official brands. If you're willing to go off brand, you can get all of these for maybe a cheaper price, and you can even get a 90 millimeter one for the Canon. So one thing worth noting, the Canon one says macro, while the Nikon one says micro. So it's the same thing, just different brands, different names, don't be confused. Okay, let's do a little troubleshooting. So when it comes to camera and lens, there are two frequently asked questions that we get. The first one is my full frame camera has to get so close to the patient. The number two is my cropped frame camera has to be so far away from the patient. Let's look at the first one. So why does the full frame camera have to be so close to the patient? So it is because the full frame camera does not have the crop factor, so it captures more stuff. So what if we, only want three teeth in our photo, like on the right over here. So at this time, we will need to bring ourselves closer to the patient, sometimes so close that we have to shove it right in the patient's face. So how do we solve this problem? So actually, it's pretty easy. Just get an extension tube for your lens. So for example, this is the one that I use. It's a 12 millimeter extension tube which basically increases your focal length, therefore extending the minimum focusing distance so you can be further away from the patient. Also, you can use it very flexibly. For example, when I take portrait shots, I take this off. When I take intraoral shots, I put it on. Okay, the second question. My cropped frame camera has to be so far away from the patient. So why does this happen? So again, the crop factor comes into play where we get a cropped image so what if we want to fit everything, the whole mouth into this cropped image? So we will need to distance ourselves from the patient, sometimes so far away that we need to tip our toes, especially if you're not a very tall guy. So we call this the tiptoe effect. So how do we solve this problem? Actually, it's very easy too. So just use a slightly shorter macro lens. So for instead of going for the 100 or the 105, you can go for the 90 or 85. So now we'll discuss a little bit of the equipments that all of us we need. The flashes, mirrors, retractors, contrasters, and diffusers. So let's start with the flashes. So we, what we would like to suggest is that every dentist must have the ring flash. It's like the basic one that every dentist must have it. Because if you're taking any occlusal pictures, it's very good in that. And also it it, it actually supports your basic necessities. Now, if speaking of the twin flash and the twin flash with the brackets, it distributes the light and it does not focus it on one area. And we are going to show you the differences between the pictures taken by the ring flash and the pictures taken by the twin flashes. Now, speaking of the speed light, now it's mostly used to take external photos but there is, a, there is a thing called donut that we will discuss it also in the demo also. It makes, if you use it with that, it makes the pictures really much, much better and diffused. 
And now we have an LED ring light. It's mostly used by models, the smaller version of it. Uh, but if we buy a bigger size of it a little bit, you can use it to take extra oral pictures and smile pictures, and it will give you an amazing diffusion. Also, we have another demo, and I, I don't know if you can see it behind me. We have it set and ready. So when we'll go in the demo, we'll take pictures with this and show you also. So here you can see, as I mentioned earlier, that the ring flash is focused and it's a bit harsh on the teeth and sometimes it takes away the details. But if you compare it to the twin flash, it, it, what it does is that it increases the area and it mimics the nature. Okay, so this picture is taken by a studio flash setup again where the light comes from up and down and both sides. And that's why it makes it look appealing, okay? So now in the next slide, I'm going to show you how the setup of this picture, if you wanna take pictures like these, how the setup of this looks like. So setting up a studio flash is part of our demo also, and we'll show you step by step how much does it cost, uh, how to buy it, and how to set it up by yourself. So just talk a little bit about the backgrounds, but they are not so expensive, but they add a lot of value when you do it in front of the patient. When you ask the patient to sit down in front of the background, take a picture, this shows how much you care about dentistry and how much you care about your work. And it's also, it's just a one-time investment. The thing is, if you don't have enough space in your clinic, maybe you can just have one room. If you have a bunch of clinics, then you can have one room is specified for dental photography, and then you can take all your pictures there. Now, speaking of the backgrounds, you can go with any color you like, but in dentistry, we mostly prefer white or black color. So here are the different studio flash that I will show you. Here you have the important one here, the studio flash on the left side. Now it comes in a rectangular shape or an umbrella shape that we have and we will show you. Now regarding the pocket bouncers, uh, now regarding the pocket bouncers, it redirects light away from the subject at a 90 degree angle and it softens the harshness and the light is not lost. Now this one right here is the one that I told you, it's called a donut or a ring light diffuser. And this, we will have a demo, so we'll discuss it in detail. Okay, so we can actually use these diffusers in different situations. So for example, this is diffusers utilized in surgical photos. So the one on the left is without diffusion. The one on the right is with diffusion. So in my opinion, the fusion makes the blood even look better. So for, for example, this photo here uh, is an intrabony defect with quite a lot of blood in it. So, but however, with the diffusion, it gives it a, like a shiny feel. Okay, this next one is a photo of a shaman implant after placement. So you can see there's blood, there's metal, cementum, usually a disastrous combination. However, because of the diffusion, we still managed to get an aesthetic photo. So this next one, even worse. So as you can see, it's a huge intrabony defect with calculus, blood, roots, granulation tissue. So once again, with diffusion, we managed to get a photo that is uh, Instagram worthy, in my humble opinion. So now if you look at, there are two pictures without diffusion and with diffusion. So if you look at the one with diffu without diffusion, sorry, the line angles, the texture, all of these things are lost because of the harshness of the flash. But if you look at the picture with diffusion, you can see, first of all, you can appreciate the symmetry that it appears, the central incisors, the laterals, the canine, plus the anatomy of the teeth is preserved. Now, some people, they do argue that the diffusion takes away some of the anatomy, but I would like to say that if you use it right, you can preserve most of the anatomy. So now here you can say, it's another example that even a non-dental person would appreciate that the picture looks nice. Now, this is a picture that we took 
especially sometimes that when we when you when the work is old and it has some stains on it and it's not even up to the right mark but because of the good quality of the picture it makes it look appealing now let's talk a little bit about the contrasters so they play a very very important role especially when you start fixing up your pictures in the computer now on the left hand side of your screen is a metal one and the right side one is a silicone one the metal ones are much cheaper but they are rigid so they are a little bit uncomfortable to the patients compared to the silicone ones they are expensive but very comfortable to the patients so now we will show you a small keynote trick on how to get a picture something like this So simply just by using your keynote, you can achieve something like this. And also, uh, when we have photos like this, as you can see over here, we can do some tricks to persuade the patient to follow your treatment plan. So let's look at this short video here. <laughs> So now let's discuss a little bit of the mirrors. So there are so many types of mirrors. What we would like to suggest to you is that you buy scratch proof metallic ones because they're going to stay with you for a long time. Plus uh, it's better than to buy the cheap ones and then they go bad so quickly. Uh, again, the retractors, it depends on your pref personal preference. And as long as you can get the results, then that's it. For me and Dr. Lee, we personally uh, prefer the black retractors because it also helps us in cropping, which we'll show in a small demo. So now my next few slides are especially dedicated for the interns and students watching. Uh, this picture in front of you is an occlusal picture, upper occlusal picture. When you are taking a picture, make sure of few things that you get till the last teeth. And if you are unable to get it, just you can angulate your cam camera a little bit. Try to keep everything in focus and try not to have any kind of bubbles or any problem. You can use that. You can use occlusal retractors and occlusal mirror. This picture is taken by these two things. And if you crop it, this is how it will appear in the end. Now another example, if you did a nice crown or crown preparation or you did cementation and you are really proud of and you would like to take some nice pictures, so what you need is you need a lingual mirror and regular retractors and take a picture. Try to make sure that all the teeth are in focus, the pictures that you're going to take, all these things are in focus and then if you crop it, will appear something like this. Now we will talk a little bit about when you are taking a picture and you have to go in the molar area and you're shuffling the mirror up the back. Uh, sometimes the fog comes on your mirror. So what's the solution for it? Now there are multiple solutions. Uh, we would like to discuss one of them, which is the safest one, which is water bath. So water bath is something very simple. You just need to pour some water in it and heat it up and put the mirror inside of it. So what should be the temperature? So according to the studies, the breath of the patient is same as the body temperature. So we are talking about 98.6, 98.7, something like that Fahrenheit. So you can set up the temperature to 105 or something like this of the water and leave your mirror inside. So before you start taking the picture, you can take it out, you, you can take your mirror out and you can take the picture. There is another way for some people, they use the flame to heat up the mirror. 
this is also a way you can use it, but it's not like, you know, using flame in front of the patient. It's not that ideal. So we would like to suggest that you use a water bath and this will be an end result. You can see there is no fog or anything on it. So now the next picture is the lateral picture. Now I know many of us, we suffer while taking it because the patients, their cheek, they are suffering. The patient is trying hard to close and you are trying to get the best picture. Now, the first key is you have to take the confidence of the patient. You have to make them believe that you are on their side and what you are going to do is good for them. The documentation is important and you are going to take benefit and the patient is going to take benefit. So if you do it right, then even the patient is going to bite in the right MIP that you needed and then the picture will look nice. So this picture, we took it with the regular retractors and buckle mirrors. So what you need to do is put the retractor first on the contralateral side and take the mirror out of the water bath. And then we will show you a small trick again in the end of presentation on how to put the cheek retractors smoothly in the mouth of the patient. So here you have the final product in front of you. Now, there is another technique by some people. They say that you don't need a mirror to take the lateral pictures and you can just take the picture directly. Now, there are some small issues when you do that because the light cannot reach till the last molar or till the second molar, as you can see in front of you. But this is a technique used by some and if you feel comfortable doing it, I mean, it's on the market and you can do it. We did it by using the buckle retractors. Now, when we talk about the frontal pictures, you have tons of options, but you have to know that this picture, it's not only important to you to post it or to show it to the people, it's also very important to the patients because if you do anything in the interior area, it's going, the patients are going to be very concerned about it. And as Dr. Nadia said in the first lecture of the SPS, that are you really sure that the layman population is really layman till now? Because right now the patients come they are so concerned with the color, shape, size, and everything. So you have to make sure that you can take a very good picture. So now we're trying to show you that you can take a reasonable picture in this slide using a ring flash and a self-retractor, like you can see on your screen now. You can use it for frontal shots. Okay, so the point we're trying to make is there's no single instrument that does everything. So the more tools you have, the better. So let's take a look at what Dr. Masood and I have. Yeah, so I don't think the video is going very smooth, but as you can see, so we have a lot of instruments. If you, if you don't think that is a, a lie, you have to know that we have multiple ones for each one. So actually that's a lot combined together. Okay, which brings us to our next topic. So this part is the, uh, the most uh, boring part or the most exciting part, depending on how you look at it. But nonetheless, we believe this is the most important part because you need to know the fundamentals in, able, in order to manipulate your camera. So when it comes down to the fundamentals, it comes down to three things, the exposure, the depth of field and the white balance. We call it the basic trio. So let's take a look at the exposure first. So what is the exposure? The exposure is the total amount of light that will reach your camera sensor. So if you don't have enough light that reached your camera sensor, you will have an underexposed photo. Showing there. Yeah, okay. And then if you have too much light that reach your camera sensor, you will have an overexposed photo. So if you have just the right amount of light, you'll have a properly exposed photo. So what determines the exposure? It is again determined by three things. We call it the exposure triangle, which is the aperture, the shutter, and the ISO. Okay, let's talk about the aperture first. So what is the aperture? It is the opening inside the lens. So on the camera, it is dictated by the F stop or we call it the F number. So usually it's F and then the number or F slash a number, it's the same thing. So what is the 
PPF number. It is the focal length divided by the diameter of the lens. So when you do simple math, you can realize that when the F number goes up, the diameter goes down. So this is why when the F number on the photo here, you can see when it goes up from 1.4 to 4 to 8, the lens keeps getting smaller. The diameter keeps getting smaller and smaller. So one thing you'll just have to remember is the smaller the f-stop, the bigger the opening, the brighter the photo. So a lot of people get confused by this, but when you understand it's just a simple equation and simple math, it's actually very easy. But also the f-stop determines something called the depth of field, which we will talk about later. But that's why in dental photography, there are only limited f-stops that we can use. So for intraoral, we suggest f22 or up, for portrait, we suggest F16 or up. Okay, the, the second element in the exposure triangle is the shutter. So some people call this the shutter speed. I don't like to call it the shutter speed because it is not a speed at all. It is a time. So it is the time that the sensor is exposed to incoming light. So on the camera, it is measured in fractions of a second. So for example, here, this is one 160th of a second. So the larger the number, the more time we allow the sensor to be exposed to light, the brighter the photo. This is very straightforward. However, if we leave it on for too long, we will capture movement. What do we mean by capture movement? So we always use the most classic waterfall example. So as you can see, the photo on the left has a slow shutter, meaning it is exposed for a longer time. So therefore the movement was captured. The waterfall turned into a stream. So on the right, it is a fast shutter, meaning that it was exposed for a shorter time. So it only captured a frozen moment. So in dental photography, we usually set the shutter at around one one hundredth. So you can adjust accordingly, but if you leave it on for too long, just remember, you will have a chance to capture movement, which we don't want. Okay, the third and last element in the exposure triangle is the ISO. So what is the ISO? It is the sensitivity of the sensor. So a lot of people ask, why is it called the ISO? So I checked it out. So it simply stands for International Organization of Standardization, ISO, which is the main governing body that standardizes sensitivity ratings for camera sensors, among many other things. So that is not important. Just remember ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. So before we continue, let me remind you that the amount of light that reaches your sensor is solely determined by the balance between the aperture and the shutter. So the ISO has nothing to do with that. The ISO is just how it reacts. Is it sensitive to the light or not sensitive? So on your camera, it's, you can usually, it's on, usually on the far right and you can adjust it uh, according to what type of camera you have. So for example, I have the Canon 60, so I can adjust it from 100 to 25,600. So the ISO is actually our savior when aperture and shutter have reached their limits. So what do we mean by that? Let's give you an example. So you can see over here, this is a photo that is too dark. However, let's say we cannot decrease the F number because of the depth of field issue, which we will talk about later. And we cannot increase the shutter because of movement issue. Let's say we are already at a borderline where we increase the shutter, then we will get movement. So what do we do? We call in the savior. So we crank the ISO up from 100 to 300, and you can get a brighter photo. However, you will have to remember the higher the ISO, the more noise or graininess you get. So let's look at an example here. So these two photos are taken back to back. The top one with a ring flash, ISO set at 100. The second one with no flash at all. So I had to crank the ISO up to the maximum 25,600. I had to lower the f-stop to 20, and even so it was too dark. So I increased the exposure in Lightroom by three units. Lightroom is a technique we will talk about later. So anyways, we got a photo that is uh, kind of bright enough but you can see it's very noisy. There's a lot of graininess in it. We cannot use this photo. So that's why you have to remember to keep your ISO as low as practical. Usually we set it at 100. You can go up from there. I usually, uh, I personally experience with 300, 400. I think it still works pretty fine, but just remember the higher you get, the more noise you get. 
So now the next part of the trio is the white balance. So what is exactly a white balance? As you can see on your screen, now you're looking at a white wall, okay? So what happens here is that if you put a cool light, also known as the moonlight bulbs, or a warm light, also known as the sunlight bulbs, so when it falls on a white wall, so your brain, so the eyes, they send a message to your brain and it interprets it as a white wall, right? But that's not the case when it comes to the camera because it does not have the brain. So what do we need to do? We need to actually tell the sensor of the camera by ourselves that what kind of light is going to enter when you will take a picture. So it doesn't do a distortion or it doesn't do a wrong color in your picture like the way you can see on, uh, on the screen. So what's the right option? The right option to choose is between one of the, these two. Either you go with the flash if you're using the flash or you can go with customized white balance. So now, now in, the next, in this picture, I'm going to show you a picture taken with multiple different white balances. The first one, taken with 4,000 Kelvin, and then 5,000 Kelvin, 6,000, and 7,000. Now, with all due respect to the surgeons and periodontists, for them, this white balance doesn't matter that much. But for the aesthetic dentist, operative dentist, general dentist, prosthodontist, this thing means it has a, whole, it, it, it has a huge importance for us. Where, when you are doing taking shade on when you are discussing it with the lab during the lab communication, this is very important. So you make sure that you have the correct right balance. Okay, the last and the third element in the basic trio is the depth of field. So this one is very easy. So what is depth of field? It's the distance between the closest and farthest object that are in focus. So for example, you can see this photo here where it has a very narrow depth of field. So only part of the image is in focus, where if you have a wide depth of field, everything will be within focus. Okay, so believe it or not, on the camera, it is again dictated by the f-stop. So the higher the number, the more depth you get. So let's look at an example here. So we took these two photos back to back, the left one with an f-stop of 32, where it has a wide, depth of field where everything is within focus. The second one, the one on the right, has an f-stop of 16. So it has a very narrow depth of field where only two teeth are in focus. So it may be confusing to a lot of people, but for dental professionals, it's actually very easy, very convenient. Why? Because just remember, if you want all 32 teeth in focus, you need an f-stop of 32. So this is by uh, Dr. Miguel Ortiz. He's a prosthodontist based in Boston. So it's very, very convenient for us. Just remember, if you want a wide depth of field, you need a, a big f-stop. So now just look at, looking at your camera, for example, if you're looking at your camera, let's just go through everything quickly so you guys can remember it and I hope you can always use it in the right way or in the best way possible. So try to always leave the camera on a manual mode while you're taking dental pictures. Try to keep your shutter speed uh, above 100. If you're taking intraoral photos, then your f-stop should be 22 or above. If you're taking extraoral or, extra -oral or portrait photos, then it should be 16 or above. Your ISO, you can set it up as low as possible, but it, you, 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 you can go up to 300 or 400. You know, this is from the personal experience. Now, regarding the white balance, you can keep it as flash or customized white balance. And then the last, but not the least, is that you, when you're taking your pictures, try to save them as raw. Because if you want to save the pictures in the high quality, that's the right one to save in. And we're going to discuss it a little bit in detail also shortly. But let's talk about the five fundamental photos in the life of a dentist that everyone has taken and everyone will, we will keep taking till we will end our careers. <laughs> so the most important thing here is that let's go uh, by each picture and then we'll discuss what makes a picture look good or how can you evaluate the right picture. So if you look at the upper occlusal photo, you can see the lips and cheeks are completely away from the teeth. Nothing is touching. 
and the focus is on all the teeth. And at the same time, there is no saliva on the occlusal surfaces. Now, if you look at the frontal picture here, the same way, it's, it has a no angulation or very minimum angulation plus no saliva that you can see and you can see the focus is still the molars in the back. Again, the same thing is with the sides. You can see that the teeth are in occlusion and also the focus is optimum. Now, talking about the lower picture, you can see that the tongue is completely retracted. No part of the tongue is on top of the teeth. And also at the same time, the focus is on all the teeth and there is no saliva. So now let's discuss a little bit about the soft box or a studio flash starter pack. What are the things that you need? What you need is you need an umbrella soft box that you can see in the screen here, or you need a rectangular soft box, depends on your preferences. We have here uh, umbrella soft box and we're going to uh, show you all the things. And then you need two speed lights or three speed lights, depend on how many soft boxes you have. And then you need a wireless flash trigger, speed light mounts, and in the end, tripods. Here you, you can look at the items of the umbrella soft box. You can see the umbrella soft box, the speed light, the speed light mount, and the tripod. Now you can replace the speed light flash with something called a strobe. But a strobe is a continuous light. It's not just a flash. So what you can use it, you can use it while you're doing DSD videos, or you can use it as a background white photo. So here you have an example in front of you. That's how you set up a background that you can take perfect pictures with. You have two soft boxes, a background and a chair, and that's it. You can go ahead and start taking very nice photos. So now we will discuss a little bit about the extra oral photos. So with the ring flash, you can achieve. You can, you can achieve something that is basic. But you know what's the problem? You might make the patient feel like a prisoner and it will look like kind of a prisoner photo. So that's why we would suggest that you move towards the studio flash and take something that is vibrant. Like something like this right now on the right hand side. Now here you can see that you can make the person feel like a model instead of a prisoner. Now in another picture, uh, what I would like to say is that according to the researches, they say that after 30 minutes, people lose their concentration. So what we are trying to show you here right now is different stages of a relationship. That when you start a relationship, how happy you are in the beginning. So that's the left hand side of it. And then the next picture is in after two, three months. And then the third one is <clears throat> after marriage. Now, this picture in front of you is mostly taken by the orthodontists. Why? Because the orthodontists, they like to see the incisal inclination of the teeth. So that's why they take this 45 degree angle picture. Again, this picture is taken by the studio flash. Here you have an example in front of you, in front of your screen is a DSD example. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Instagram show off. Most important thing these days is the white background and how to achieve it. So if you look in your screen, now what you need to do is you need to put one of the soft boxes behind your object and you can use one or two soft boxes in front of the object. So I'll just get, show you some of the examples. If you use this setup, you can achieve them like this picture or you can you take a picture like this. Now the big question comes that why always are the pictures on the Instagram, it shows the females eating berries with lipstick and gloss. Why it can't be a man biting on an apple or, or why not an orange? Exactly. So now let's talk a little bit about the lab photos. You can take basic lab photos with ring flash or twin flash. All what you need to do is you can buy just a black cloth, put the object or whatever you are trying to take a picture of on it, and you can take something that is uh, reasonable. But if you would like to take your photography to the next level, what you need to do is 
you need to do a setup like the one you can see on your lower right corner of your screen. Now, this is a picture of a maxillary and a mandibular removal partial denture metal framework and 3D printed guides. And you can see the setup right here. So you can utilize the same setup or a similar setup in taking uh, bloody photos. So for example, I take a lot of uh, tissue graphs, uh, extracted teeth, and you can make it look really good too with uh, a similar setup. So now here you can see another picture of three implant platforms, narrow platform, a regular platform, and white platform. Now the idea what we are trying to say is that if you do a good work, you did a good crown, you did a nice restoration, the idea is to show it off in a right good resolution way. So just remember the trick is to put your flash behind the object so you get that white background. So now, as we said earlier, that we're going to discuss a little bit about the shade guide. It's a whole other topic, but we just wanted to add it because it's related a little bit to the dental photography. So according to the research is conducted and one was published earlier this year, they said that 70%, I swear, 70% of the ceramists and the dental technicians were not happy by the communication of the dentist, which means that the way the dentist have provided them the information of the patient was not enough. Either the pictures, or the way written on a prescription form, B4 or C2 as a shade guide with three lines on it, it's not enough. What you need to do is you need to take very good quality or at least reasonable quality photos and send it to the patients, uh, send it to the ceramics, sorry. And here we would like to show you some of the examples that you should not do it this way, should not be done in this way. On your left-hand side, you can see an underexposed uh, photo with wrong angulation. And on your right side, the Exposure is so harsh that it took away all the details and all the teeth looks like the same color and everything looks the same. So what you need to do is that you can see in front of your screen right now, we did a seven second rule we, that we will show you in a demo also that how to take a picture. In this, we use the two closest shades to the teeth and then we took this picture. And then the winner was A3 shade in this case. Yeah, so I always thought that I had an A1 perfect white teeth until Dr. Masood showed me that my teeth are actually A3. So I'm like seriously depressed right now. It burst his bubble. So now we'll show you the setup on how to take these pictures. It's very simple. You need two uh, studio soft boxes, black or a white background, aim and shoot. Okay, the last thing we want to touch base on, which we mentioned a little bit about earlier, is why shoot in RAW file. So what is a RAW file? It's a file format that captures all the image data recorded by the sensor when you take a photo. So when you shoot in JPEG, it actually takes that raw data, compresses it, saves it according to the camera settings, and therefore losing all the raw data. So on your camera, remember to select, always select the raw, and then we also select JPEG. So we have both, both at the highest quality. So let's look at an example here. So this photo is taken in RAW. So you can see the file format is CR2, which means CAD and RAW version two. So the uh, file size here is about 20 megabytes, where on my camera, the JPEG is about five megabytes. So the only downside of using a RAW file is that it takes more space on your SD card. But that's not a problem because SD cards are so cheap right now. Personally, I use the 128 gigabyte SD card, so I will not have a problem at all. So next thing you need to do is you need to use a software that can read this raw file and adjust it. So for example, the one we use is Adobe Lightroom. It's probably the best out there. So here's a short video example of what we did and hopefully it goes smoothly. So, so anyways, uh, after this adjustment, we can get a photo like this. So this is our final result, So which is actually pretty good. So if you remember the original one, let's look at it over here. 
So you can see there's huge difference. We turned an unusable photo into a, actually a pretty good one. So you will never be able to do this with a JPEG file because there's no raw data in it. You need a raw file to be able to do this. So now before we start with the demo, we would like to show you just a couple of uh, cameras available on the market that are a little bit away from the regular cameras that the dentists use, like for example, the mirrorless camera. It's a new technology. It's something like a phone camera, but with better resolution. And chances are that in the future, it might replace the current DSLRs. On the right hand side of your screen is a Shofu. It's a special camera, especially designed for dentists. And it starts with around $5,000. That's the basic version of it. So what does it do? It's unique. So if you're going to take a picture of a surgery, so you'll choose in the setting surgery. If you're taking a picture of a whitening case, you will take a picture, uh, you'll choose in the options, whitening before, whitening after. And if you're taking a shade guide, you can choose shade guide. It takes a standard photos, but they are not that amazing, but they are very good. Now, the Smile MDTP, when this was released, I am sure I was one of the most excited people because I wanted to throw away all of this amazing setup and I thought I can replace it with this. But sadly, I was wrong. Why? And uh, because when I started using it, the diffusion, the quality, all of those things were wrong. And, and actually, it, it was not the case what I thought. And then I discussed it with the other people who were using it. And they all told me that the results were unsatisfactory. But it is available and it is out there on the market. And if you guys would like to buy it, it's, it's around $600 or something. So with this, we conclude our presentation part, and now we will move towards the demo part. So thank you so much for the people who are listening, and I hope that you guys have uh, got all the information that you needed, and then you can now apply it. So before we start with the demo, we would like you guys to click on our pictures, the video part, so it becomes bigger. Yeah, thank you so much. So it becomes bigger so you can sh see it exactly. So the first thing that we will start off with is the softbox. So as we showed you, that this is the tripod stand here. I don't need to explain the tripod stand definitely, so it's the basic thing. And this right here is the umbrella softbox. So this is the umbrella softbox. So all what you need to do, why it's called umbrella softbox, because it opens up exactly like an umbrella. I guess you can see it in your, the panel. I would like to let me know that if you guys cannot see it good, just we can, you know, change a little bit. Uh, I believe it's fine. Oh, okay. So, Unless we receive okay. comments, Thank you. I'm going to let you know. Thank you. So now, now, what you need to do is, there is always an opening here in all the soft boxes. Here you can see it. It's in the rectangular soft boxes, in the umbrella soft boxes, all of them, it's the same. All what you need to do is use it to put it inside the tripod. Now, this is the tripod, the mount that you're going to take it through. And you just tighten it up. And that's it. Now, what you need to do is, this is the speed light that we showed you. You just mount it right here, like you're mounting it on your camera, similar things. Now, if you look here, I hope it appears that these are reflectors. The shiny thing are the reflectors. So your flash should be pointing directly towards the reflectors. So it will bounce back and it will hit this huge diffuser cloth. And then that's how your picture will look nice. So here, what we are going to do is we are going to, I'll just switch on the flash. And then we are going to set it up. Which one do you have open? Yeah. And now you are ready. You are ready to take all the nice pictures. So we will show you also some pictures, before, but Dr. Lee would like to show you. Okay, so this little thing right here is the wireless flash trigger. So this one is by the company Godox. 
and both our speed lights are from Godox. So it means that the three can connect with each other. So we need this and then we're just gonna put it on the uh, flash mount of our camera. Let's see if you can see it. Okay, so you just put it on the flash mount of your camera. Okay, so it should be good to go. Can you get the... Yeah, I'll start this first. So now we'll give you a small demo. So now this is a small softbox that you can put in your impressions, your crowns, anything that you would like to take, even if you would like to take artistic pictures, if you would like to take pictures with files, anything you can put these things inside. And this is a small version. Now some dentists, they, they have a bigger version of it, but we personally don't like to use it because in, all, in the dentistry, all the things are small enough to fit in this one. So what we did is just to show you the demo, we sacrificed one of these ones so you guys can see it when I take the picture. So this is like the real version of it because it's covered from all the sides except from the front. But we cut a hole for you in this one. So when I take a picture, you guys will be able to see it also. So all what you need to do is that you put the thing inside. Now always there is a rule of taking the picture of the object in three angles. You can take it straight, you can take it with 45 degrees or you can take it from the top, which is 90 degrees, okay? So I'll take one picture and then we'll go ahead from there. So again, these two soft boxes are coming from the side. So for the first picture, you go ahead, you hold your camera, you go forward. You take a picture. I'll try to show you guys, I mean, with all the limitations that we have in reality, our demo is not like a demo. We actually make all the participants do everything by their own hands. But sadly, due to Corona, this is what we can show you. So I'll show you the picture that I took. Yeah. So here you can see the picture. The crowns are in focus and the picture looks bright and diffused. Now what other things that you can do is you can use in the same box here, you can put veneers, crowns, anything, and then you can take some nice pictures that you see on the Instagram. Okay. So that was the, uh, the flash setup. And the next thing we're gonna talk about is uh, some things that we didn't cover in the presentation yet. Okay, so if you can see my camera over here. So we're gonna talk about a little bit about the lens. Let's see if you can see it over here. Okay, so when you look at the lens, usually there's a AF and MF, meaning autofocus and manual focus. So a lot of people like to shoot in autofocus. However, in dentistry, because uh, when you shoot in autofocus, a lot of the mouth, inside the mouth is very dark. So it's very hard to focus. So personally, I like to use manual focus. Okay, so I turn it to manual focus. And remember, uh, you need a minimum focusing distance, right? Because you wanna take close-up shots. So use the minimum one. So use the 0.311 instead of the 0 0.48. Okay, and then uh, in manual focus, you will need to learn to manipulate the image ratio. So for example, we talked about, uh, you have to have a one-to-one -one image ratio to be called a macro lens, which is over here, okay? So you just have to remember the setting. So for me, when I take close-up shots directly, I usually use one to 1.5. The reason is one, point, one to one is actually very, very hard. It, it still gets us very close to the patient, which is impractical. So I use one to 1.5. Okay, so for mirror shots, I usually use one, the other way around, one to two. Okay, and when I take full mouth shots, I use one to three. Okay, so remember, because the image ratio, the focusing distance is predetermined. So for example, this one is 0 0.49 meters. So that's why you see people when they take photos, they go in and out in and out because they're trying to find the focusing distance. So if you master how to use the manual focus, the, the light 
uh, doesn't matter that much. The surrounding doesn't matter that much. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is uh, the flashes. So you can see this is a ring flash over here. This is my ring flash. It's uh, by the company Nissin. Okay, so there's other ring flashes like this one is the Canon ring flash. You can see it's a, a similar, but a little smaller like this. Okay, so the good thing about the Nissin ring flash is that it actually can expand. So let's see, it can expand a little bit like this. Okay, so it basically turns the ring flash into kind of like a, a, a dual flash. Uh, it's not a real one, but uh, you know what I mean. Okay, so when you set the, the flash over here, let me show you the settings. Okay, there are actually only two, two modes that we use in dental photography, the TTL and the manual. So what is the TTL? It mean, uh, means through the lens. So what it does is you, pre you predetermine a flash output. And then uh, when you take a photo shot, your camera actually reads the situation and then uh, tells the flash to compensate accordingly. So you will not have full control of your flash. So that's why we suggest that you use the manual flash. Sorry, it's very bright here. Let's get it there. Yeah, okay. So that's why we suggest you use the manual flash. So when you use the manual flash, you have full control of your flash, right? Because we know the settings already, we do not need the flash to compensate for us. That's our job. So that's why when you use the manual flash, you will have a, a more consistent result because you control everything. Okay, the next thing I wanna show you is the dual flash. So this is the dual flash. This is the MT24EX by Canon. So you can see these two things on here are actually small diffusers. So I can take them off. Okay. So when you take it off, this is what the flash looks like. Uh, can you hand me the, the soft box? Small, small soft box? No, 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 yeah. Okay. And then you can actually replace those small diffusers with these uh, soft boxes. So let me get this a little further away. So you can put this soft box on. It actually will get you a better result. Like this, do it on both sides. So that's the settings. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, is uh, shade guides. So now, as we all know that yes, shade guide is all in all a different topic, but we just wanted to give you something a quick demo of it, so everyone just gets familiar on how to use the shade guide. So the there are many uh, techniques. The one that we are going to demonstrate here is the seven second rule. So the seven second rule says that don't look at your shade guide more than seven seconds when you're comparing it to the teeth. Because if you do, your eyes will become fatigued and you will not be able to identify which color is matching. And there is another study, uh, and it has actually been published also, that they say that the eyes of a female, <laughs> they, they can distinguish the colors better than males. So if you are a female dentist, you are better. So now what's the seven second rule that is you raise your hand up, ask the patient to smile, and then you quickly go in front of the patient's mouth and then you go away. So when you do that, you're going to apply an exclusive criteria and what you will do is you will just quickly remove the colors that do not match with the patient's teeth. And then you will go back again and you will do it uh, quickly. So what I will do is right now, I will hold my hand up, look here, look at the colors and I'm going to quickly remove the colors that I was sure that they do not match with the patient's teeth. So now again, I, I'm left off with few questions. So now again, I will raise my hand up, go is, is stop for seven seconds in front of the patient's mouth and then I will go back. So again, I will remove the ones that I felt like they are not so good. And now this is how I'm left with one or two teeth sheds. This is where it makes it easy. And then again, the third time you go and then you stop here for a second and you look at the patient and then you can go forward. And this is where you can also take picture in the end. And always when you're taking a picture, try to make sure that you, there are some doctors who take pictures with the incisal edge down, but it's always better that you, the incisal edge of the teeth is with the incisal edge of the teeth shade guide. Now there's another 3D shade guide, but as I said, that it's, it's another whole course to discuss. So we are, we're going to stay with the basic shade guide. Now the other thing is that we wanted to show you is the LED ring light and how to take pictures with that. 
because it will also help you a lot when you're taking smile photos especially. So this is an LED ring light and it has multiple range of powers. So you can go from the brightest to the lowest, depends on what exactly suits you. So I'm going to set it up on something that is reasonable, put it in front of the patient's mouth. And then all what you need to do is So what you, what you need to do is this is okay. so what you need to do is when you're taking a picture you need to put the camera in the middle you cannot go far away or you cannot go far back what you need to do is you need to be in the middle not too far that you go towards the patient's mouth too much and you hurt the patient no and at the same time you don't go so far back because when you will take the picture right here this is when you will get the best optimum results so let's try to take one And take one more. Now, this is how you take the picture. Now, again, if you have any other questions that we can see in the Q&A, so we can show you some other demos. So how can I see the questions? Yeah, we'll just show you one last thing, then we'll take the questions. There are so many questions, man. We need yeah, to answer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the last uh, thing I want to talk about is, uh, is the speed light. So there's actually a, a trick. If you manage to stay until now, then you'll learn the trick. So how to turn the speed light into something very useful. Because speed lights usually when we use in portrait photography, it's very hard to use in intraoral. Okay, but when you have something that we mentioned earlier called the donut. So the real name is uh, the ring light diffuser. Okay, sorry, over here. So it's this thing, it's the ring light diffuser. Okay, so we call it the donut. So it actually can expand into a pretty big thing. Okay, and then what you do is put your uh, put your speed light onto the camera. Okay, and then what you do is put this, this let thing. Me show them here. So there you have two holes, one for your lens and one for your light. So when you put it in. So usually put it in. Okay, so what it does is it turns that speed light into a huge ring flash and it is very diffused. So you'll get very beautiful photos with this. Okay, but the, the thing with this is because it's very big, it's sometimes hard to use, you have to practice, but this is how you get a lot of very good results without having to take out the studio flash. Okay, that's our last trick for today. So we're uh, so, Dr. Anas, can, yeah, should we open the questions? Uh, yeah. and how, how are we going? Yeah. Uh, anyhow, before answering the questions, I would like to thank you, Dr. Taha and Dr. Lee, for your informative and well explained presentation. You two really made it easy to understand and grasp the fundamentals of dental photography. Uh, it is so clear that you two put really great effort in preparing this amazing presentation. Also, your effort in the live demo is really appreciated. I'm sure the audience enjoyed and gained benefit oh, from your there presentation. There are a lot of Sorry to disturb you, Dr. Anas. There are a lot of people there saying that, uh, that you know, they want it recorded, recorded. So yeah, the SPS has recorded the lecture and yes, later on we will, see, we will see how we can yeah, give it to them. Yeah. Indeed, Thank the you. lecture and the presentation, is, it, it is recorded and we will see later how we can share it, if possible. Uh, you can see the Q&A uh, oh. section below, right? Okay, yeah, now I can see. So there is one question that says, could you please give me the reference of the study regarding dental technician satisfaction on the communication? Yeah, I can, I can send it, yes, of course. Definitely. Uh, Taha, what is the program I, that we uh, use for it? The program you, that we use for it. Uh, uh, could you please, uh, do you still need the screen of your laptop, the thank you slide, or you don't? No, no, I don't no, need no. it. Uh, could you here. please stop sharing that screen? Because I need to put the, uh, the question of, yeah. Wait. Okay. Okay. So as usual, uh, dear participants, I think you can see the screen in front of you. Uh, I think it's a little bit small, but we will enlarge it later on. This is the question of Dr. Taha and Dr. Shanley's uh, presentation. Uh, as usual, you can go to our Twitter account. You will find the tweet regarding this question. So don't forget to vote and reply back with the correct answer. 
uh, Dr. Taha and Lee, you can continue answering the questions. Okay. So, so one question here, it says that, can I use two speed lights with soft boxes instead of using twin flash? Yes, of course, of course you can, and you will get more diffusion. But the thing, the difference between the twin flash is that it does not diffuse. It, it separates it, but it does not diffuse. So if you want to use the speed light with soft boxes, definitely you're going to get better results. What are the settings for twin flash? You wanna, sure, we, can, we can maybe yeah. publish those settings later on because it's yeah. long. LED light, we don't need a flash to take the shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the LED light, you don't need, you need to switch off your flash and then you can take the picture. Can they, can they see the questions? No, I don't think so. you have to repeat. So I will read yeah. the question. The question is with LED light on, do we need a flash to take the shot? No, you don't need the flash. The LED light, just close the flash and take the picture. Okay. Uh, Dr. Taha, uh, sorry for interrupt. Uh, yeah. If you see the questions, you can uh, press on the uh, type answer and then just type any letter for the uh, for the question to be shown to all participants before answering the question instead of reading it all. You know what I mean? That would be easy for, for all of us. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll take our time to answer the questions. Sure. So, yeah. So I guess our, our live live thing, live stream is uh is ended right now. You, your live, yeah, you're, you're still live with us. We can see you both. Oh, okay. But do, do, do we uh, answer the questions right now or? Yes, 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 There's sure, so go many ahead. Men. But just before, yeah, them. just before answering any question, when you read it, just uh, press on type and answer. And then just type any letter for the okay. audience and participant to see the answer, the question that you're about to answer, because it's, they have a different platform. No, when you're explaining, what you're when you're explaining to me, uh, Doctor Anas, when you're explaining to me, I feel like an 80 year old guy who doesn't know how to use Zoom. Really? <laughs> then show us your expertise in Zoom. No, he said he type answer. I don't know which type answer. Use diffusers with drink flashes. Okay, type answer. Okay. Can you guys see now the question that we are yeah, anyways, speaking uh, any of? Can we use diffusers with ring flashes? Use diffusers with ring flashes. Well, the thing with, uh, with that is because there are no, no uh, ring flash diffusers on the market right now. So, so if, you, if you want it, you have to make it yourself. But uh, yeah, hopefully one day we'll have, we'll have something like that. So right now, if you want a ring flash diffused, you will have to use the uh, speed light and then you have to turn it into the ring flash by using a donut. So now the next question that I would like to answer is that there is, because I care about the dental students a lot. And this is by a dental student. She, she said that I'm a dental student, fifth year. Do you recommend to buy all these flashes or should I buy one of these, which is better to my level? So yeah, I, I would honestly would not like to recommend you to buy all of these flashes, you have to start somewhere. So to start somewhere is that you buy the camera body, buy a macro uh, lens, and you can start with the ring flash. And then while you are on the way in your career, then you can switch to twin flash. And then from twin flash, you can go on to the studio flash. That's how you go. I mean, that's what I would like to suggest. The answer of the question is here or Twitter. Yes, it will be on Twitter. Dr. Anas can explain better. They are asking uh, that they are going to answer the question here yes. or on Twitter. No, the and question you about, should go on. Uh, go on our Twitter account at Saudi Prosto, as you see on the screen. You will find recently, or maybe now, that tweet with this with the same question. So vote for the right answer, and then reply for in the same tweet with the right answer as well. Not 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 on here, nor in the email on our Twitter account. So okay, continue, doctor. Sorry, and doctor I would Sean. like to apologize. I have not answered anyone here, but we would just like you to know that we are on Instagram. Uh, me and Dr. Lee, you can just shoot us with the questions there so we can answer all of them because I'm so sorry, but there are so many. <laughs> Too many uh, yeah, I think it will be another two hours lecture. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to answer uh, everything we know. Yes. Yeah, if we don't, we'll, we'll check it out. You can Sorry. contact us on our Instagram accounts and we will answer you all what you want. We are here yeah. to help you. Even if it's something related to dentistry in general, we are all here. Okay. So now there is a special message from Dr. Lee for all the, especially Saudis who are watching. What would you like to say, Dr. Lee? 
I would like to say, wa insha Allah ashrafkum garib fi Saudi. After the corona ends. Okay, see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you so thank much, Dr. Shali and uh, Dr. Dr. Allah for amazing presentation. Really, thank you. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Good. Really made it really nice and real beautiful to understand the fundamentals of photography, dental photography. Uh, so and you have uh, been the best host I ever had, Dr. Dennis. <laughs> really? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, of Anyhow, uh, the, the 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 tweet is already tweeted in our uh, account, and there are people who already answered. So you can go in our Twitter account and uh, see our uh, and see the tweet and vote for the right answer and reply back with the right answer as well. So thank you so You're much, Dr. Platik Shanley, again. And uh, I think most that's- Most welcome. Be... You're most welcome. Yeah, that will be the end of our today's okay. presentation. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow at the same time, inshallah. And have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Can you, can you record all this? Yeah, of course. I'll just be trying to... Yeah.